Because there are going to be people watching and listening to the show today who are going, flow, resistance, pressure, what? What's this all about? Sound check. Check one. Check two. Um, so probably a good place to start is just a really very brief overview of how vocal sound is made. Um, so when airflow generated by lung pressure uh, sets the vocal folds into vibration, essentially you get an interruption of the transglottal flow, that is the airflow that moves between the vocal folds. As that airflow is interrupted, you get these changes in pressure, increased pressure, decreased pressure, compressions and rarefactions as they're known. And you can think of that as the sound source or the, the signal, the sound wave. Essentially that then travels through your vocal tract, which includes your throat, <clears throat> your mouth and your nose. Um, and then the sound leaves your body, listeners hear it, and then they form an opinion on what they think your voice sounds like, which is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> um, but essentially that, that's it. So you've got the, the air pressure, which is the driving pressure that causes the vibration. You've got then the resistance at the level of the vocal folds, and there's varying types of resistance we can get into in a bit. Um, and then depending on how much resistance there is, you've got the resultant airflow. Um, so probably a good place to start is the subglottic pressure or subglottal pressure. I use these terms interchangeably. Um, but essentially when we talk about subglottal pressure, we're talking about the air pressure that builds up below the glottis, the glottis being the space between the vocal folds. So it's a piece of anatomy that's actually a space, which I find really kind of cool. And the subglottal pressure is largely responsible for vocal loudness, something we want to have great control over dynamics, right? And it also has, a, to a smaller effect, an impact on pitch. Um, so let's start with vocal loudness. If you increase subglottic pressure right now, if I'm kind of quieter and I go, uh, to get louder, I increased my subglottal pressure. And if you reverse that, you can get quieter. Um, and to a lesser degree, pitch. But yes, yeah, subglottal pressure is largely influenced by three main forces, that being muscular forces in the body, elastic forces, and gravitational forces. And very quickly, the muscular forces are your muscles of inhalation and exhalation. That is your uh, diaphragm, your internal and external intercostals, the muscles that control rib movement, as well as all of your abdominal muscles. You then have uh, elasticity. So if you take a really deep breath, and your body expands, your ribcage expands, diaphragm moves further down into the body. What happens is your lung tissue and your ribcage um, are moved away from their resting position, uh, particularly after a really deep breath. And then a elastic recoil, at least um, for a certain portion of the phrase, will be driving the subglottic pressure. Unless restrained by muscular forces, the muscles of inhalation, etc. And then you have the, um, the gravitational forces. So, Posture is a big thing that plays into this. Uh, if you are upright, gravity is going to have a, an inhalatory effect on the diaphragm, essentially drawing it down towards the ground. Whereas if you're lying in a supine position on your back, uh, gravity is going to have an exhalatory effect on the, your abdominal muscles, essentially drawing them into the ground and driving yeah. the increased air pressure. So that's, that's pressure. And that, again, then kind of links, if we look at the pitch aspect of that for a second. Resistance, we talked about resistance at the level of the vocal folds. And uh, essentially, when people refer to resistance, they're often referring uh, to the idea of adduction or abduction. Adduction okay. being to, to think about adding things together or bringing things together in this case, or abduction apart. And, um, and so adduction and abduction really are largely responsible for another key parameter in voice, which is the phonation type. And I, I was watching one of your videos the other day on phonation types, you know, on a range from breathy phonation, which is characterized by very little glottal resistance. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got press phonation, press. which is a lot of glottal resistance. And I, I, think, I think I know the video you're referring to, and I actually quote Professor I'm Sundberg here. in in that, <laughs> because he's got that really succinct way of saying it. but anyway keep please keep going yeah yeah so yeah so he coined the term uh, i believe flow phonation with Ugoffen back in uh, 1979 and so that that kind of falls in the middle of this spectrum yeah. which is i think uh, he, he calls it the highest amount of flow or the highest flow pulse um with uh full closure of the vocal folds or brian Gill would say optimal closure of optimal. the vocal folds yeah and so you're really dealing there with less subglottic pressure and less adduction. Um, and it's a really a, a efficient way of using the voice because yeah. you can get quite a boost in energy 
Yeah. Um, but you get less friction and collision with regards to the vocal fold tissue, which is, is important because we, we have to consider not just aesthetic output, you know, getting certain sounds, but, you know, minimizing tissue costs so that people can have more stamina and endurance, you know, across a gig, but also longevity with their voice over a lifetime. Uh, so things like press phonation, where you're, you're kind of pressing the vocal folds together and there's more of a tissue cost. Yeah. <clears throat> now we have to be careful with that and maybe occasionally use that on mic, you know, as an effect, but yeah. uh, try to minimize that because of the tissue cost. And as you know, every singer is different in what they can handle, you know, the thickness of the protective layer that the mucosa on the vocal folds, et cetera. And obviously, you know, the, the level they're at with technique and so on. So we, yeah, we, we've got to be wise with, with using things like press phonation. This is the difficulty I find for many people, for many student singers is um, learning or, or, or exploring and, and discovering their own anatomical limits mm -hmm. and, and recognizing that what I can do is not necessarily what Zach can do, is not necessarily what Beyonce can do, is not necessarily what Ed Sheeran can do. We're so keen to create normative values. And there is a, we, we, there's a ballpark, but within that ballpark, everyone's going to sit at different points um, exactly for the anatomical reasons you just outlined. Amen to that. Yeah. <clears throat> and it is tough, you know, it's tough when people have the pressure of an audition yeah. or they're in the role and the, the, they're being told they need to do it a certain way to, to, to come across emotional or, or to like their character and and there's got to be a balance of patience with regards to the long-term development and being able to make maybe the closest sound you can make to what what is required but with the least tissue cost so that so that you don't you know lose your voice halfway through a run yeah. of a show or something yeah. like that it's hard to teach it and it's also hard to accept it as the student to go yeah. that i i may not have the capacity of the person who I admire or want to be more like or or the the role that I want to perform in sports um, we know that there are there are certain morphologies that are built for long distance running marathon mm. and yet there are certain morphologies that are better built for sprints and those two extremes do exercise themselves and and develop their bodies in keeping with the discipline that they're pursuing. And we're talking about elite expression of these disciplines, yet there's almost certainly, if we were to take um, the elite of the marathon and look at their body shape and the elite of the, the sprinters and look at their body shape, Almost certainly, if we take it back to the genesis of them wanting to get into those sports, you would never recommend either of them to do the opposite. Yeah, there's limitations that we have to have to acknowledge, and it's a it's a tricky balance between not putting someone in a box and say, well, "Let's figure out absolutely what you can do more potential," and let's be patient with the timeline that it takes yes. to do that. Yes, and then the same token saying. There's a limit to the thickness of your muco mucosa and, and then also how much hyaluronic acid is present in the vocal fold, both things that will protect the vocal folds from impact forces and collision, you know. So beyond those limitations, then it really is about, within those limitations, optimizing what it is that you do from a physiological standpoint, um, which again comes back to these things, fine-tuning subglottic pressure yep. um, and, and balancing that with adduction forces so that you can get the aesthetics that you that you want or you need or at least as close to you know at least the version that your body can produce sustainably and you know again that a lot of the things factor in too like amplification particularly with contemporary singers it's, it's one of those things that if you're going full out because you listen to a recording and you go it sounds like they're going for it and you don't consider the fact that they are singing into a microphone and there's a lot of things that happen in post-production like that's you know you've got to come sometimes you need to start with that um that said, I am a fan of, of helping singers figure these things out without a microphone first yep. and, and figuring out physically what feels yes. comfortable, yes. what's sustainable, and then learning to use the mic as an extension of that. But The yeah, development of kinesthetic awareness, I consider it so important that I start my first lesson with a student is, a, is we talk about that. 
-hmm. it's it's so important that we're connected to our instrument physically and that we really tune into those physical aspects of what we're experiencing as the anatomical instrument and that's it I, I think i got this from you know dr brian gill but it was that you know in a, in a particularly in a first voice lesson if not throughout the journey it's like we're not just here to develop coordination and to be more expressive but part of that process is heightening your proprioception you know yeah. it's this idea of a proprioceptive yep. barometer <laughs> kinesthetic barometer and yeah if you have that heightened proprioception which is what elite singers have yes. yeah. then you can start to kind of tell when you are pushing too much and there's excess subglottic pressure and because of that heightened awareness yeah you can then the heightened coordination start to adjust yeah but uh, if you've got a heightened coordination and low proprioception then it's hard to troubleshoot with regards to uh knowing when you are giving it too much etc yeah. so you've got to develop that awareness yeah. in the process you know? and and that's harder to develop for some than for others i think some people are able to really tune in very quickly very easily to their body and what their body is telling them and and others find it more challenging